Hey everybody, welcome to the Dreamer's Edge podcast. With Nicholas, I write video game reviews for the Dreamer's Edge. And I'm Dimitri, webmaster of thedreamersedge.com and movie critic. Now, uh, last time we talked about the Monday television grid. We're going to continue our discussion of what's coming to you this fall and winter on television by talking, of course, about the day that comes after Monday, which is also known as Tuesday, I believe. Indeed. But before we do all of that, we're going to do a little something I like to call show and tell, and that's when we recommend a little something, and of course this time we're going to recommend to you a couple of TV shows we like. Yes. So, I would recommend the show Bullshit, the first season mostly. First and second season were very good. After that, they kind of started running out of topics and running out of arguments too, and it, it came very bad, but Bullshit, they basically talk about certain topics that are controversial, and they show how, you know, wrong they are. It's not so much topics that are controversial so much as what they refer to as gree popular beliefs that uh, they want to debunk. Yes, that that's a good, better way of saying it, yes. It's with Penn and Teller, uh, magicians in, uh, in Las Vegas, and uh, they're very good. We both watch the show, and every time we talk about it, we yeah. always get up into a, a debate. Always an interesting one, yeah. Uh, because I actually think that even from season one, they tend to cheat with their arguments. They tend to use uh, straw man arguments a lot, slippery slope lo- uh, logic. There's some interesting facts that they, they reveal through it that are very interesting, and I do believe in the concept of show of exposing uh, fa- these false beliefs and sort of inviting you to question them. But a lot of the time when they're trying to prove their point, they create other false beliefs. And, and I do have a lot of trouble with that. Yeah. Although sometimes sometimes I don't agree with them at all as mm-hmm. well. Like when they, they, they try to debunk like uh, anti-smoking laws and they, they're completely wrong. But, you know, it's still entertaining. And that's why I recommend it. I just don't take everything they say at 100% face value. It's, no, you, you know, really shouldn't because yeah. they're, they're, they're magicians with their, with their uh, logic and arguments as well, as you say. Indeed. Uh, I'm going to recommend something a little bit different. I'm going to recommend Forti, which is a Quebec show about a police unit that hunts down um, serial killers. Now, I know a lot what a lot of you think are going like, what, Criminal Minds? It's like, no, completely different. What's kind of cool about Forti, and it is translated in English, so you can see it in English, is that a what they're doing, they're showing you is a police unit that is stuck taking care of really messed up cases and it's affecting them slowly. They're becoming worse and worse cops as the series progresses. And uh, they don't have the one hour format. It's it's not 45 minutes and it's the cases solved. The cases are sort of told more realistically where it takes them several weeks uh, of episodes to solve a case. And usually a new case will start halfway into that. And, and they're they're always handling several cases at the same time, and they're not solved at the same time, which gives you sort of this more realistic feel to it, which I thought I liked a lot. Yeah, I, I watched the series in French. It was enjoyable. Good recommendation. Let's get to the discussion of the Tuesday Grid. What can you expect from ABC on Tuesdays this fall and winter? Well, at 8, you got... Last Man Standing. Before we comment on the, that, I just want to point out that it's followed at 8.30 by Man Up, and then at 9 to 10 with Dancing with the Stars. Why this is important. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's describe Last Man Standing. Go ahead. I think Tim Allen mm. is trying to regain his manhood and, you know, take over a society that's been controlled by women, or as he feels, I guess. Yeah. First of all, Tim Allen playing a, you know, big man, macho man again. You know, really, you're going back, you know, with typecasting or something? Well, what's wrong with, with this? Well, is it typecasting? Because he, he, when you think of, uh, I was going to say Tool Time, but actually the show was Home Improvement. Yeah. When you think of Home Improvement, which is what Tim Allen is known for, he was pretty emasculated in that. But he was trying to, you know, play as the big macho guy. And I'm not sure he can play a big masculine man, <laughs> really. It's Tim Allen. Come on. He has actually more range than I think you give him credit. I remember seeing him in Red Belt, where he just plays a major douchebag. Okay. And uh, he's very good in it. Very see, convincing. I can see him as a douchebag. I just can't see him as a real macho <clears throat> man. <laughs> mm. I have a problem with that premise. Because the whole idea of... Well, there's two ways it can go. They can actually go where... He's genuinely trying to rebalance the world because it's completely geared towards advantaging women. And come on, get real. Like, yeah, what kind of world is that, honestly? Exactly. <laughs> it's sort of like, I'm not saying that there isn't parts where uh, feminism or so called fem- feminism, I should say, have sort of gone awry and put, you know, men and boys of our generation in a position where 
they didn't need to be, let's just say. Like, I'm going to give an example that's concrete so that people don't misinterpret what I'm saying here. Because yeah, I, I realize <laughs> that that's delicate. But for example, uh, in our generation, what happened uh, with education is that, you know, it was always believed before uh, that somehow men, uh, like boys, were smarter than girls because they did better in school. And then what they came to realize is, of course, that that's all related to the way that uh, kids are being taught because boys and girls absorb information in a different way. Their, their brains don't absorb information uh, the same way, so they need to be taught differently. Now, the, that's the logical conclusion you ought to be drawing from that. Yeah. Unfortunately, what happened in the 90s is, well, they did the experiment. They started teaching a different way that would be more geared towards the female mind. And then suddenly the girls did a lot better at school and the boys did less well, as would be expected. Yeah. And their conclusion, instead of saying, oh, that means that boys and girls learn differently, they went like, ah, oh, see, that means that when you teach the correct way, women are smarter than guys. And you have a generation of men who feel inferior, who have less education, uh, but it's still a male-dominated society. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it, men still make more money than women. Yes. They're still more employed than women. Yes. So the idea that, like, oh, we're being oppressed by women is like, grow up, you know? Yeah. Or maybe he's annoyed because his wife has a room in his house or something that she decorates and something and he can't do anything about it. He wants to take the room back or something. I don't oh, know yeah, where they're true. going like that. That the, the one I just said, that that's even worse, I think, than, you know, oh, well, my wife is dominating me in my marriage, so I need to get my balls back. He's like, you know, come on. Yeah, because that's even denigrating to women to a certain degree. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that show, um, I, I wish it a rapid and swift death. <laughs> There's, an, uh, there's a third way he could go with it, though. Okay. Where he's an idiot. Where the idea is he's like, I'm going to claim the world back as a man. And all the while you're laughing at how much of an idiot he is and then what, uh, how unrealistic his view of the world actually is. I guess. But even then, that doesn't work. But then for the opposite reason where, you know, a lot of men feel that way. It's a parody worth doing just because, you know, a lot of men feel that way. I mean, like, I, I, I write for AskMan.com. That's an audience of men who, if you go onto the comments board, you'll see there's a very large section of the audience who feel very frustrated as men and don't feel that they have as much opportunity to express themselves as men as women do, which I don't agree with them, but it is how they feel. Okay. And whether or not they're right or wrong, it's important to note that a lot of men feel that way. And I'm not sure just mocking them without trying to understand why they feel that way is necessarily ethical or helpful or even amusing. Well, it won't be amusing to them. That's for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. you <know? laughs> well, I don't think it would be amusing for me. You know, I, that's true. And what's kind of funny is that it's followed up by man up as I, re uh, as I mentioned, which is the same freaking premise, except with three guys instead of Tim Allen. Although I can see the three guys being macho, because I don't know which three guys are. I could see them hiring macho, you know, macho-looking actors instead of Tim Allen. So that might work a little more. Still not a good show, though. No, I'm still not going to watch it. <laughs> For all the problems we just mentioned, it's not. It's not a good premise. It's um, the war between sexes is not as hilarious as sitcoms keep trying to convince yeah. us it is. I know. Let's make a show about racism and you know, have it funny, you know. Said in the Bronx, and the guy goes to New York and gets treated like crap. Uh, that that'll be funny. <laughs> so that's an excellent point you bring up. Why is that funny? Whereas any other sort of prejudice is uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, all right. And why that's funny is it's also because it's followed by Dancing with the Stars, the show that your wife makes you watch. It having your wife force you to do stuff makes you a little less manly. And then it's followed by Body of Proof, which is the Dana Delaney. Um, Jerry Ryan show about uh, cops and coroners and... Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't watch it uh, last season. This is their second season. I didn't watch it last year. Uh, mm -hmm. The commercials looked interesting enough, yeah. but I'm sort of like cop showed out. I don't know. I, I like those shows where, you know, you get evidence from, you know, you find the evidence and it's about evidence, them catching the guy, not just, you know, oh, we're on the streets and we're, you know asking people and beating people up until we find who's, who's responsible. I like those kind of shows where you get evidence. Like, I kind of like Bones. Mm -hmm. I enjoy those. So I might give it a shot. I didn't watch it last season, but, you know, my, I might try it out if there's nothing better. 
Well, you know, Dana Delaney and Jerry Ryan are certainly good reasons to watch them. They're they're both very good actresses. Oh, they, you were going for actress. I thought you were talking about how they could they look. <laughs> well, they're both very attractive as well. Yeah. That's true. They're they're both attractive. <laughs> But they're both very good. I mean, yeah. like, say what you will about... Everybody makes fun of Seven of Nine for her ridiculously tight costume, but what you have to observe is that she was very good as the Borg. Yes. As opposed to, like, in the more recent ones where they had the Vulcan that they had to write in that she was getting emotion as a disease because she couldn't act emotionless. It was too hard for the actress, so they had to... Yeah, she played Seven of Nine very good and, you know, very stoic. And when she, she got sicked out and had emotion, she could play it very well, too. Very good actress. Uh, all right, so let's move on to CBS. Uh, well, CBS, I think I figured out what their strategy is. Because they start off at 8 with NCIS. Yes. Then at 9 with NCIS Los Angeles. Okay. And then at 10 with Unforgettable. We'll get to Unforgettable later, but let's talk about the NCIS and the NCIS uh, City of Masks. Uh, <laughs> all right, so NCIS. Ninth season. I actually thought it had been longer than that because it's a spin-off of Jag. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not uh, not entertaining. I don't know how they managed to take a kind of format I like and make it unsufferable. I guess I don't like the characters because it's really not fun for me to watch. It started off well. Like, I like the first few seasons because it's very oriented towards the military procedures and how that's different from, you know, normal law enforcement. Yes, that's true. And that was very cool. Yeah. And then they started going goofier and goofier. Like the, the characters started trying to be funnier and funnier and funnier. And that's when it went like, uh, you know, like you are solving more murders. It's, it doesn't have to be sunshine every episode, you know? Yeah. yeah, it's true. I mean, I compared those characters to the characters from shows like that I watch. And I don't enjoy them as much. So I kind of put that show on, on the side there. You know, if, I'm going to, if, I, if I don't want to be cocked out as well watching too much, you know, of these kinds of shows, even though I enjoy them. So eventually you have to put some to the side. <laughs> and yeah, NCIS was pretty much the first one I dropped. Yeah, I will admit that I don't follow NCIS. Uh, I caught, I think, the second and third season in reruns and thought that was pretty good. And then even then I got bored pretty quick. Yeah. And of course, their, uh, NCIS Los Angeles is not at all like NCIS. So it's Chris O'Donnell and LL Cool J uh, as experts of uh, subterfuge and putting on masks and making you think that there's somebody else and doing cop work and i'm like fast lane <laughs> <laughs> but i'm like what does that have to do with the navy police like this is such a weird i guess they just thing. wanted to, i just wanted the name to get the, the audience mm. that seems that sounds horrible i didn't even i didn't try to watch it because i thought it was just, just going to be like like csi another csi in another city but that's that that is horrible. That's a horrible premise, really. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's it's not a good show, man. I caught a few episodes here and there without even watching them in full. I'm like, this is just silly. Yeah. And, and it's, it is not helped by the fact that the two main actors, every time you see them, it's like, oh, it's Night of the 90s has been. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what wow. <is> this? <laughs> You're cruel. <laughs> I mean, like, now that Skeet Ulrich is off uh, Law & Order um, Los Angeles. Yeah. Oh, and he's already in Los Angeles. Maybe he can join the cast. I'd be like the perfect trifecta. <laughs> like, what are you guys doing here? Poor Skeet. He doesn't deserve that. <laughs> oh, no, it's like LL Cool J can pass off as different people. And Chris O'Donnell as well. They're both talented actors. I like yeah. them, actually. And Skeet Ulrich can be like, we need someone to look like Johnny Depp. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then at 10 is followed by Unforgettable. And this one's actually kind of interesting. A cop woman who has an endemic memory. She cannot forget a thing. Cool. And that's her twist. Like, give me, uh, if I mentioned this two years ago, but cop shows, there's so many of them. Often you have the offshoot, which is the gimmick cop show, well, where the cop you, has a gimmick. You need to or else, you know. Because it's always the same thing otherwise. Yeah, exactly. And her gimmick is actually interesting. She has an endemic memory. That could yeah. be fun. Yes, indeed. I'm going I'm to check it out, see how, it, how it's going to look like. At least that network has their things in their thing right new. That's the cop night, you know. You don't go from, you know, manly show to dancing to, you know, it's really like cop, cop, you know. Yeah. So. It's a straightforward strategy. Exactly. If you have an audience for the first show, it's going to stay there the whole evening. I haven't checked the other days yet, but like uh, we talked about the Monday and it's like CBS was all about the comedy shows. Yeah. You know. The half hour sitcom format and now they're all about the police uh, procedurals. 
I, th I think they really are aiming towards the old strategy of like, we're going to build follow up so that you don't want to change channel. Yeah, I can see that. Time to move to NBC then? Indeed. All right, then. NBC has from 8 to 10 the biggest loser starting its 12th season. With different coaches, I think. Really? Yes. I think the old coaches, they called it, you know, quits. It's enough's enough. And uh, they have new coaches now. Um, so, you know, if there's nothing else interesting, I usually put that on as background. It's entertaining. You know, you get to see, you get to see people take their, you know, get their lives back and complain the first few weeks that it's hard. But yeah, yeah, of course it's hard. But then, you know, they, they, they learn and they get their lives back and they lose weight. And I, I enjoy that. Yeah, I mean, like, the, here's the thing about it. They complain that it's hard, and I don't blame them for that. Like, I'm sure they came in knowing it's hard, but I'm sure they didn't realize how hard it is. Yeah. Because exercising regularly, especially at the level they are and the level they're starting from. Yes. That's pretty brutal. I know. I use the house strategy when watching that. I eat food in front of them and pretend that they can see me. So, <laughs> I enjoy that. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Uh, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. They're always so <laughs> likable, too. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they really want to make, you know, an effort. And uh, last season was kind of an exception. They had Rulon Gardner, like a former Olympic champion. Mm -hmm. He was kind of a jerk. <laughs> but, you know, he realized why he was there and he got the help. And eventually he, he didn't even go to the end. He was like, okay, I'm done. I, I, I'm, I'm the way I want to go. I need to work on stuff at home. I'm leaving. And he just left. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Well, at least he didn't take the prize from anyone, I yeah, guess. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, he was there to get his, his back on track, and he was pretty entertaining as he was doing it. But I, I, after that, I was like, okay, that's it. I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> and it's followed at 10 with Parenthood, which is at its third season. All right. And uh, for those of you who don't know it, it is the remake of the movie with Steve Martin, Parenthood, with the same writers, in fact. First of all, it's it's an uncomfortable show to watch. It's good, uncomfortable in the sense if you want to be challenged, that's kind of fun. But okay. it does make you question a lot about parenting, the your style, your own style of parenting, and also the style of parenting you refu you receive because it explores both. And it, it's 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 yeah. Don't follow that if you're in need of psychotherapy because it just brings up issues. Is what I'm gonna say. It's like I see. <laughs> You're fine the way you are. That's it. <laughs> uh, but also, it has Lorelai Gilmore, um, Lauren Graham as as one of the most obnoxious characters on television. She plays that well. Yeah. But you know what it is, though? It's that essentially what they did is they took Lorelai Gilmore, but they placed her in a real world context instead of the fantasy Gilmore Girl contest. Okay. And then you realize this person is as dysfunctional as all get out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Because there's okay. only so much crap, a fa you know, two, three families can go through on a weekly basis yeah. in the course of several seasons. Yeah, eventually, you know, it starts feeling artificial that, hey, another another bad thing happens, another thing, another thing. Like, really? Yeah. How, how many bad things happen to you in, you know, in a year? And it's like, come on. All right, on Fox. Well, from eight to nine, we got Glee. You're the Glee fan. I don't watch Glee. I'm a Glee fan. That's a big word. And uh, I watch Glee. You're a Glee. You're a Glee enthusiast. Well, actually, the term is Gleek, would oh, you believe? The official wow. term is Gleek. I am not a Gleek, though. I watch Gleek. Uh, I watch Gleek, pardon yeah. me. I, I, I also watch Gleeks from my window. They don't like it. It's a little <laughs> bit creepy, but whatever. Uh, but uh, I watch Glee, I uh, but I have qualms with it. I, I watch it because it's funny. Okay. The music is a little bit kind of obnoxious for me. I, I, I sort of tune out when they start singing most of the time. That's the whole point of Glee. <laughs> Yeah, not for me. The jokes are for me are really funny. Okay. Uh, and I'll be honest, they, they have sort of a little bit of a hypocritical stance on a lot of issues. And I'm a bit tired with their Asian bashing, for example, which I don't mention just because I'm Asian. Because it's a show about welcoming the outcasts. Yeah. But they keep stereotyping Asians and making fun of Asians. And it's sort of like it comes off hypocritical. Like if they weren't a show about accepting everybody... Then the Asian bashing might just be funny in the yeah, context. I but can see that. It comes off hypocritical, and that's the hypocrisy is one of the things I really can't stand in okay. fiction. You know, and the songs have just gone worse and worse.